worship. So if you'd like to stand, you're, you're welcome to. If, if you feel more comfortable sitting, please do that. Whatever brings you closer to the, the Lord and draws the Holy Spirit in. solid B plus. Let's, let's try it again. I, I feel like we can get to A status, right? Hey, good morning. Good morning. Man. Double golden stars. Hey, it is great to be with you guys this morning. You can go ahead and grab a seat real quick. Uh, my name is Aaron Perry. I'm the lead pastor here, and I am so 
excited to see so many faces I know and many faces I don't know or faces I haven't seen in a while. I believe with my whole heart that you are not here by accident this morning, but you are here with great intentionality and purpose. And we hope and pray, no matter who you are, where you've came from, whatever you've brought in with you today, uh, that you would feel the love of Christ in this place and you would hear from the Lord himself with a message that he has specifically for you. Uh, I'm excited. We're going to keep worshiping in a minute, but I want to draw your attention to a few things happening in the life of our church that I'm going to go through. If you've got a bulletin as you walked in, you can go and grab that out. But before we do that, I would encourage you, especially if you are newer here, to grab a connection card. You can either grab a physical one that's in the seat back in front of you, or if you go to our website, southcreek.church, there is a digital one there if you're like, oh, I don't want to kill a tree, or if you're watching online, Hi, by the way, your breakfast looks wonderful. And uh, we uh, encourage you to fill one of those out real quick. That's a great way for us to know who you are, how we can connect with you, how we can serve you, how we can pray for you. And uh, also, if you're like, oh, I'd love to know more about what's going on in the life of the church, you can get on our emailing list, things like that. Fill that out. If you are new here today, this is your first time, or maybe you've never uh, uh, filled out a card, again, welcome. We are so glad you are here. But we'd love for you to fill out that card, even if you use a fake name, although we prefer real names, and uh, uh, go ahead and take that card to the Connection Center, which is, there's a desk out in the lobby. Words say Connection Center, can't miss it. And uh, there we have a free gift for you just for being with us. It could be the world's largest pumpkin as your gift. You don't, I'm not saying it is, but it might be. And you'll never know unless you go there. Now, to be fair, if you're like, I don't have a vehicle for that, it's not actually that. But just go find out what the gift is, say hello to someone. And uh, again, we just want you to know that we're so glad that you're here with us. All right, let me run through a few things that are happening here uh, at South Creek. The first thing is this. Uh, I want you guys to know about South Creek. We're a place where it's okay, where you don't have to have it all together, and you don't have to pretend you do either. So I'm going to not pretend that I do either for a minute uh, for two reasons. One, I kind of forgot to get a video ready that was needed for today. And two, Hunter, can you throw me that box? I kind of forgot to bring the box up here. This is on purpose. No, throw it. This be, oh, come on. She has a cannon. She just doesn't want everyone to know about it, and it's great. Uh, hey, we are starting off the season. Uh, isn't it crazy? Christmas is going to be here soon. I know we can get into blood wars when people talk about when it's appropriate to listen to Christmas music, but I, I, I'm getting close. I'm sorry. I've been thinking about Christmas lately. But one of the things that's coming up for Christmas soon that we partner with... Uh, uh, Samaritan's Purse is Operation uh, Christmas Child. We do these shoe boxes where uh, you can grab one in the lobby. There'll be instructions there, but basically what you do is you grab stuff and uh, it'll lay out what you can grab, what you can't grab, and then these get sent all around the world to kids, oftentimes in places like third world countries where uh, they may not really get something like presents and things like that, especially at Christmas time, and they also get to hear the message of the gospel. And so this is an easy thing to be a part of. Um, again, if you get one, you'll open up the box inside, and it has some information about what you need to do. It just costs a $9 donation. And uh, anyways, uh, it starts now. We'll need them back by November 7th. And I just want to real quick, would we express appreciation to Shirley Sellers and Rena Lee, because they always take care of this every year. I feel like I should curtsy to you ladies because we don't deserve you. You guys are the best. Uh, anyways, moving on. This Saturday, I don't care what plans you already have, cancel them. This Saturday, we have our fall party that's going to be happening here at the church. Obviously, weather, please, Lord, stay nice. Plan is to be outside. This is for all age groups, so don't feel like this is just for like, oh, if only 50 kids. This is for everybody. You have, if you're not here, I will, I will drive to your house and bring you, Okay because I want you there, every single one of you. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have uh, a hayride. There's going to be a pie-eating contest, which I'm kind of excited about, and I kind of hope I get picked to be a part of. Uh, there's going to be games going on. It's just going to be a great opportunity to hang out. Now, the church will be providing some smoked meats, which sound delicious, by the way. Uh, but what we're asking is, based off your last name, uh, you'll see in the bulletin, uh, you bring a certain dish of that nature. Now, if you want to bring more than one dish, if you're like, hey, by the way, I might be in the dessert 
category, but I have a casserole that is to die for, bring both. We're not going to tell you no. But it's going to be awesome. Bring, if you have like a camp chair, you may want to bring that, but we'll have some tables and chairs set up as well. But it's going to be a great time. There'll be fire. Eventually, there'll be a movie kind of later in the night that's a kid-friendly movie. But here's what we really need you to do. If you're planning on coming, which we all are, as we've already talked about, uh, what we need you to do is go to our website, southcreek.church, go to the events tab, and register there. Now, if you're like, listen, I don't do the whole computer thing uh, for a million different reasons, Fill out a physical connection card today, and in the message response area, just write in uh, that you're coming to the fall party and how many are coming with you, okay? So, it's going to be awesome. Make plans to be there. Hey, really exciting things. If you might have noticed, you have kids today. They're in a different area than they normally are because right now, uh, our play building uh, that we have been, you know, raising funds for for a while to get the actual indoor playground pieces in is officially in process. So it's been fun this week watching the guys working in there. Uh, I'll be honest, it's one of those where, have you ever bought something off the internet and you're like, you think it's going to be one size and then you get it and it's like, this is not what I thought. I'll be real with you guys, it's better than I thought. Like, I'm not even just saying that. Yeah, we can clap for that. It is impressive. I'm excited. And it's going to be an awesome tool to reach people with the message of Jesus. Uh, Last couple things I want to tell you real quick. Uh, Notice just the rest of that's going on here. But in the back over there, you're going to see on the wall, there's some handprints. It was not a preschool project gone wild where kids got finger paint happy. Those are little hands that you'll see with a name of a child from our preschool on it. We'd encourage you to grab one if you have not already. Grab one of those little hands with a name on it and put it in your Bible, put it on your fridge, put it somewhere where you'll remember to pray for that child. One of the reasons that we do our preschool is to be a blessing to our community, to provide something that they want and need, which is pretty incredible. We have about 130-some students. But it's also because out of those students, there's probably uh, over 50% who do not have a church home, who don't necessarily know the message of Jesus Christ. And so we believe in the power of prayer. So grab one of those and be praying for that child, for that family. You never know how impactful and important your prayers are can be. So please grab one of those. It's going to be awesome. And now I'm going to just stop talking so we can continue in worship. And as we continue in worship, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and please stand with me. And I'd love for you just to go ahead and close your eyes. And we're just going to calm our minds and our hearts for a second. Because if you're anything like me, we live busy, crazy, hectic lives. So I just want to take a quick moment for us to just close our eyes, to pause, to breathe, and then I'm going to pray as we're going to continue to worship. God, we thank you for just the opportunity to pause and to be still and just know that you are God. God, for many of us this morning, we come into this place with things that are heavy on our hearts, stresses in our minds. We come with grief or disappointment. We come with uh, worry or uh, burden. And Father, the beauty of your son Jesus is that he frees us from those burdens. He invites us by saying, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And so, Father God, this morning as we continue in worship, God, I pray that your spirits would be moving in this place and that we might find rest. That, God, even if it is just for a moment, we can set aside all the things that are on our mind, the good, the bad, the ugly, the real, the unreal. And, Father God, we can just experience the truth of the love that we have in your son Jesus because of his presence here on earth and because of the sacrifice he made on the cross. So God, as we sing these songs, would they bring glory and honor to you and would they center our mind and our heart on just the love that you have for us through your son, Jesus. It's in his name I pray, amen. Poor and powerless and 
and all the lost and lonely and all the thieves will come confess and know that you are holy and know that you are holy and we will sing
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. of our service to where we return and give thanks to God for his provisions through our tithes and offerings. You may be seated. And I also want to remind you that this is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we uh, appreciate our pastors here, and it would be nice if they received a few notes of thanksgiving and maybe some gift cards and encouragement to let them know how much they're appreciated for their sacrifice of time and energy. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful today that Jesus is our cornerstone. He's our strength, our help, our ever-present help in the time of need. And Father, we're thankful that you have taken care of our needs, that you've met our needs financially, spiritually, physically, emotionally. And we want to return today and say thank you, Jesus, for taking care of us. We pray that you will bless this offering and that you will multiply it for the kingdom's use in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Hey, as the ushers are passing uh, those by, you'll see there's multiple ways to give here at South Creek. You can uh, either do it here in person as they're passing it there. If it feels more fun to drop it in the little black boxes as you exit, that is uh, more than fine as well. You can also text any dollar amount to the number on the screen, or you can go to our website, southcreek.church. Both the texting option and the online option are very safe and secure. And uh, the cool thing about the online is you can either do a one-time gift if you want, or uh, you can do a recurring gift, which that's what me and my family does, uh, because again, as I often say, we want to be faithful, but we sometimes are a bit forgetful. So it's a wonderful opportunity, and thank you again for your ongoing generosity and sacrifice and just helping great things happen uh, in and through our church, from uh, our, our children's ministry to our uh, student ministry, which I'm excited about, by the way. Uh, tonight is the last night of the race, which has been this competition that's been going on uh, between the red team and the blue team, and they are neck and neck. So it's going to be fun to see uh, who comes out on top tonight. But other ministries, we, you know, we had an awesome time yesterday partnering with uh, a local ministry called Preserve Marriage Ministry. We had about 19 couples here, I think 13, which, or maybe 13 or 11, I think were ours uh, from South Creek. And uh, awesome, awesome stuff that's happening. I also want to thank you for your ongoing generosity. I want to thank Katie Rigsby for her incredible leadership with uh, our, our community outreach team. I think was it, it was like, so we collected uh, canned goods over the last month for the rescue mission. I want to say, was it like 520 some pounds of food? 522 pounds of food. That's awesome. Clap for that. That's fun. And we're doing lots of other stuff, but you know, one of the things that I've loved that I feel like has characterized our church in uh, the last little while in particular is we continue to try to point our focus outward. That the things that we have here at this building are phenomenal tools and resources to do great ministry. But more and more, I think what's incredible is to get to see the ripple effects of how we're getting to love our neighbors as ourselves in our community through various uh, different ways. So thank you so much. Speaking of awesome ways that we're loving our neighbors, mark your calendar. Next Sunday is Recovery Sunday which if you don't know, we have one of, and I'm not even just saying that, that's, that's just straight facts, isn't it, Chuck? We have one of the best recovery ministries in the area, period. And, and truthfully, what's pretty incredible is when people get uh, set up on different things like they have to for, for court things, we are oftentimes one of the first places that people are pointed to, not just because we're a faith base, but because uh, the people who are there, like Chuck McCoskey, uh, are the real deal and are all about being real. And so next Sunday, you got to come because the great thing is you get a break from hearing me, which is all God's people said, amen. And uh, you're going to get to hear some awesome stories about how God is transforming people's lives who are in the midst of recovery from addictions and alcohol and things like that. And so it's one of my favorite Sundays. Come, you may want to bring some Kleenex just in case, uh, but it's going to be really, really uh, awesome. So make plans uh, for that. Uh, I got to be honest with you guys, I'm feeling pretty uh, wonderful today because we had this uh, marriage uh, uh, retreat thing that happened here yesterday. Uh, The in-laws took uh, our kids, and so we we got to give them in the morning, and then they kept them through the night last night. Guys, I went on a date with my wife last night. We had uh, adult conversations, although, of course, they always center back to your children, but I'm feeling great And uh, I'm excited about today's message. Today, we are closing out our series called The Lost Art of Communication. And if you haven't been here, that is more than fine. What we've been exploring together as a community is just this idea that communication is something that if we ever really had it as a people, we've lost the art of communicating well. And in particular, as followers of Christ, we've lost the art of communicating like Christ. And so in the first week, we just talked about how communication, our words, our actions, our attitude, our body language, the way we listen is important because it has the opportunity to either push people towards Jesus or sadly make people turn away from him. And then in the second week, we talked about the danger of gossip. And we talked about how gossip has, again, this nasty opportunity for us to make people not want to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ because they see people who look just like them, who have had no transformation through love because they are continuing to live just like everybody else. We talked about how gossip is this terrible thing because also gossip always harms people. 
And God loves people. And so he's not down for that. And then uh, last week, uh, man, what did we talk about last week? Anyone? No one. Not even I can remember. Oh, yeah, we talked about communication in the midst of conflict. Goodness gracious. See, I was just testing y'all. You all failed. But it's okay. Grace, we're in the church. We talked about communication in conflict. And we talked about this idea of what does it look like as followers of Jesus to actually deal with our conflict and deal with it in a healthy way. Because the reality is, is when we don't deal with our conflict, we in many ways are putting ourselves in conflict with God that he deeply desires for us to take care of these issues because we are his children and he desires peace and unity amongst his children. And today as we wrap up this series, we're going to be talking about this idea of how do we both speak truth and discern truth. I joked with the, the tech guys, I was like, is there a way that we can figure out on Facebook to maybe put like a little like warning thing like you see sometimes like might not be fully accurate or something like that. That's the normal thing that we see today, right? Is constantly we're trying to figure out what is true, what is not true. We see little things that sometimes are tagged as might not be fully true. We have literal websites and people who have jobs who are just fact checkers. We live in a time full of skepticism and full of misinformation and disinformation. We live in a time where people put their entire weight of belief on opinions rather than facts. And this is an issue. And the truth is, people who claim to be followers of Jesus are just as susceptible to it as others. And here's the crazy part. The issue isn't that we just believe lies, but oftentimes we begin to live the lies. I've been reading a really great book by one of my favorite authors named John Mark Comer, and I highly recommend it. And he, he talks about this. He talks about how there's this reality that the issue with lies and deceit in this world isn't just that we might believe in them, but that we may begin to live out and live into them. And those lies can come from all certain places. But I know what we're thinking. Most of us think that could never happen to me. But the truth is, all of us have an opportunity to fall into a bit of uh, believing things that aren't real. In 1938, there was a radio broadcast that happened on the airwaves of CBS radio. Now, in that time period, you know, there's not TV. Uh, there is radio broadcast that is sort of the, the, the main uh, 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 entertainment. You know, you had newspapers, things like that. But so the radio would broadcast things like sports. It would broadcast news. And then it would also have things like music shows and talk shows. And, and then sometimes they would have radio dramas and things like that. But on the night before Halloween in 1938, as the United States is on the brink of kind of knowing whether or not we're going to get involved in World War II, there's all sorts of just um, unsettledness in our country. People tuned into this radio program, and this is one of the things that they began to hear. They began to hear about a certain invasion that was happening in New York. And these are the words from the on-site reporter Carl Phillips as this broadcast is happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I have ever witnessed. I can see peering out that black hole, two luminous disks. Are they eyes? It might be a face. But that face, ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. The eyes are black and they're gleaming like a serpent. The mouth is V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips. And it seems to be quivering and pulsating. What's that? There's a jet flame springing up, and it leaps right at the advancing men. This strikes them on the head. Good Lord, they're turning into flames. Now the whole field caught on fire. The woods, the barns, the gas tanks of automobiles, it's spreading everywhere. It's coming this way. At this point, Philip's voice automatically stops, and radio silence goes for about five to six seconds. And then there's an eerie radio static hissing And the report resumes, and it's been said that aliens have landed on the eastern seaboard, that the National Guard has been called in, bells rang to warn people to evacuate Manhattan, and the Secretary of Interior urged all Americans to fight and stand for the preservation 
of human supremacy. Now, it's easy for us to sit back and think, so, what's, I, I don't get it, what's going on? So what's happening is there is this radio drama called The War of the Worlds. And it is put on, on this radio station. And the first act of it sounds exactly like an actual report that is happening, where there's just sort of mass chaos and fear. And what had happened in 1938 is that some people turned on their radio, maybe not at the beginning of this, but in the midst of it, and all they heard was invasion, all they heard was uh, evacuation, and what actually happened is there were many people who went into a mass panic in the United States for just a little while. People who literally got into their cars, fled the city. People who began to do all sorts of crazy things. They're said that some people, uh, actually some ladies went into birth early because they were so stressed by things. Uh, well, at least one person, I think they said, uh, they, they categorized that a heart attack happened to them because of what was happening. People went nuts. Now, again, it's easy for us to say, well, that's just they bought into something stupid that was a hoax. But the rub was just this. It seemed real, and a lot of it was very real in feeling to that time and that moment. You see, most of the people listening to this had just gotten done with a huge hurricane that had happened on the eastern part of the United States where there was tons of evacuation. Again, the world feels chaotic as this World War II is just sort of beginning. It felt very real, and people responded to a lie that felt real. Now, I tell you that story because every single one of us are susceptible to buying into a lie. And if you don't think you are, you're lying. Because the issue is this. I believe that we tend to believe what we want to be true. We tend to believe what we want to be true. Now, oftentimes, we don't want calamity. We don't want chaos. We don't want an invasion to be true. But sometimes if we are on heightened alert feeling like it could happen, it's easy to quickly believe that what has been put forward must be the truth. You see, we live in a culture today, a time in history, where in many ways we are, are living in a time where my truth is sort of the prevailing ideology of the day. And this whole idea of my truth, maybe you've heard this before, uh, amongst people where they sort of say, well, like, well, that's your truth, but this is my truth. And we begin to sort of parse out this idea of, uh, of truth and, 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 and falseness being sort of like uh, subjective. Well, you can believe that as your truth, but that's not really what is going to be reality. You see, the interesting thing about truth is truth is not really dependent upon anyone else's opinion. Truth is truth no matter what. I mean, it's like gravity, right? Like I can wish and desire that gravity is not real, but if I jump out of a plane and I do not have some sort of uh, 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 parachute or something like that, the reality is I can think whatever I want about how gravity works, but when I hit the ground, I'm going to know the truth. You see, the issue is just this. Many people, even followers of Jesus, have begun to sort of say, well, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. We've begun to sort of say like, we've begun to sometimes sort of treat the Christian faith like we're going through the line at Chipotle, and it's like, well, okay, I'll take white rice, not brown rice, and uh, mm, no beans for me in this. And, and we, we sort of do that with sort of our, 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 our beliefs and our thoughts and our theology. It's like, well, I'll take the gracious God who forgives my sins, but can we get the one that doesn't forgive the sins of uh, my enemies? And uh, I, I, I really like this sort of uh, ideal of human sexuality, uh, but I really don't like this idea and this view of eternity. So, you know, we kind of want to parse out what we want, and one of the issues is just this. We all are susceptible in all fashions of life to confirmation bias. Now, if you don't know what confirmation bias is, it's just simply this. We oftentimes tend to have beliefs already set in stone in our mind, and when we go to do research on it, 
We look for things that are going to back up what we already believe. So, if you have a certain view on uh, human sexuality, you're probably going to find research that is going to back up what you believe. If you have a certain thought on, 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 on race, you're going to look for and lean into sources and information of what you already believe. Now, I'm not saying that's always wrong. Sometimes we, we, we have the right, we have the truth, we already have it set. But the reality is, Oftentimes, if we were really honest, many of us have been shaped in our beliefs far more by our culture, by our region that we've grown up in, by our family of origin, by culture than we have been by Scripture and by the Holy Spirit. See, most of us, if we're honest, if I was to tell you to paint a picture of who Jesus is, not just his looks, but what he's like, My guess is he probably votes for all the same people you vote for. He doesn't like all the same people you don't like. He's cool with the sins that you commit. Those are the like, you know, the kind of the gimmies. And the ones that you don't really like, you're like, yes, we condemn those ones. We pick up the stones then. And to be honest, that's that's likely not reality. You know, oftentimes I think the, the issue can be this, is that if we are not open to who Jesus really is, if we're not open to what it really looks like to follow Jesus and to love our neighbors as ourselves, what's the point of pretending to follow a Jesus who isn't real but makes us feel happy and safe? It's no good. It's not helpful. So this morning I want to I spend time real quick talking about first how do we discern truth? What is truth? What is, what is sort of lies? And then we're going to talk about how do we both speak truth in love and how do we speak to the falsities that we find in culture, especially that from the enemy himself. Now, let's talk about truth. In the Gospel of John chapter 14, if you have a Bible, I'll be reading from the NIV. If not, it'll be up on the screen behind me. Jesus says this. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, he's pretty clear. We don't have to dive deeply into the the original Greek to be like, well, does truth mean something different than what what we might think it is? No, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, what he truly is saying is that there is no other person, ideology, organization, uh, fill in the blank, anything else that truly is truth. That truly is freedom. Because, you know, we always say that the truth shall set you free. Jesus is the only thing that can truly set us free. Now, to, to kind of parse it out even more as followers of Jesus, we believe that not only is Jesus truth, but it, we believe that the teachings and the life and the example of Jesus is truth. Now, for us as followers of Jesus, our source of truth has to do with looking at Scripture, And we look at Scripture because Scripture tells us the story of God's creation and love for us. And not only that, his redemption for us, in particular through Jesus. Now, we follow Jesus. He is our first source above all other things. But we read Scripture because Scripture points us to Jesus. You dig me? Because here's the interesting thing. We have to read Scripture through the lens of Jesus. Otherwise, we can run into some weird things. If you pick up Leviticus without knowing Jesus, you're going to have some nightmares. You might do some weird stuff. But that is truth. And again, truth isn't something that we just sort of get to pick and be like, well, this is the truth that I believe. Because again, at the end of the day, truth always wins out. When you throw something up in the air, it eventually is going to come down. Now, let's talk about the reality that we live in a broken and fallen world that oftentimes is full of lies and deceit, which is a weird, funny language, right? In the Gospel of John chapter 8, this is Jesus talking. And again, sometimes I think we compartmentalize Jesus and be like, Give me the Jesus where he, you know, kind of looks like Mel Gibson and he's holding sheep and children are around him and he's just sort of like this jolly figure. The reality is Jesus was very real. Jesus was very raw. And he spoke the way he spoke sometimes can feel harsh, but it's because he speaks with authority. He doesn't speak out of opinion. He speaks out of 
truth. And so he's talking about uh, he, he, he's talking to someone in this moment, but he's really trying to help us understand this idea of who the enemy is. And we've sort of lost this idea that um, oftentimes, I think today in sort of our modern world, we, we, we think of Satan or we think of the devil and we're sort of like, that's just sort of this fictitious boogeyman thing we say for like our feelings and our desires. And yet if you read through scripture, Jesus and many of the other writers of the New Testament, uh, they don't really talk about him as this sort of like, fairy tale figure. They talk about him as a very real enemy that isn't just sort of this idea, but it's this entity, this person, this force that really is trying to trap us, trip us up, and keep us from Jesus. Now he says this, you belong to your father, the devil. Oof, that would hurt. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he speaks in lies, he speaks in his native language. For he is a liar and he is the father of lies. Now, if you go back to the very beginning of Scripture in the book of Genesis, we find that God creates the heavens and earth. He makes everything great. And then he's got Adam and Eve, the first man and woman. And he tells them, you can have anything you want here. The only thing I ask you not to do is don't eat from this certain tree. And if you remember the story, the, 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 the enemy, Satan, the serpent comes and he essentially tries to get them to believe in falseness about God. They begin to ask, will this really happen to you? Can you really not do this? Do you not realize that God only doesn't want you to do this because it's going to make you like that? And that's just the issue with the world we live in. We can buy into lies, we can begin to live lies, because oftentimes they're very attractive. I mean, think about sin for a minute. No one sins because they're like, I can't wait to feel gross and feel empty inside. Uh, You know, like no one says like, I can't wait to do this and make myself feel like crap. No, people sin because sin at its core, oftentimes there's an attractiveness to it. We, we believe that it will make us feel a certain way, and oftentimes, at least at the beginning, it's going to make us feel good. And that's the thing with lies. All good lies, for the most part, have some levels of truth to them, and also have some promises that are, in our mind, at least in that moment, good. Most of us aren't looking for ways to be like, how can I destroy my marriage? Most people aren't like, how can I mess up my kids? How can I go counter to what Jesus has to say? We believe in these things because it sounds great and it feels good. But that's the issue. That's just the issue. If we're not willing to lean into truth and explore truth, it's going to be real easy to buy into lies because lies can be real easy. Now in Hebrews chapter 5, Paul's writing and he says this, We have much to say about this, and this is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. He's he's writing to early Christians who, in many ways, have just sort of stopped growing. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elemental truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You know, one of the issues of why we don't discern truth well is many of us have stopped growing. Many of us lack intentionality. Many of us have become okay with sort of just being complacent, with having a moment with Jesus, not a journey with Jesus. And the issue is, it's no surprise. Again, Scripture says, we reap what we sow. For many of us, we're not discerning well because we're not growing. For many of us, our, we, we grieve the fact that our, our children or grandchildren aren't living the truth, but the reality is, if we're really honest, we've done nothing really to help them with that. I hate to say it, but many of us are reaping what we've sown. Many of us have stopped doing that. 
And then the issue is, it's no surprise when we fall into, as Scripture says, the schemes or the traps of the devil. We begin to believe ideologies that aren't real. Earlier this week, it was crazy because I was in this room, and uh, I've been in this room a lot, but I had not noticed uh, until this week that gullible was written up on the ceiling. I still don't know who did it. I just got a good amount of you. Anyone ever used to do that to their friends? You say, gullible's written on the ceiling, see if they look. You see, the issue is just this. If we're not seeking to grow, we will be gullible to Satan's lies. Gullible just means easily sort of taken, a gotcha. Again, we reap what we sow. If we aren't growing, if not, we're not maturing in those things. If we're not allowing Christ to transform us. And here's the reality. Sometimes we need to, we need to put all that we come to the table with, all our beliefs about all the things of the world, especially in the world of our faith, and just say, Lord, if there's something here that's me and not you, take it away. Father God, if I have a, a fault, if I have a sin, if I have a disposition that is unchristlike, Lord, help me see it and help me remove it. But the issue is many of us won't even be willing to ask those questions. And part of it is because some of our faith, if we're honest, is not like a house that's built on solid foundation. It's more like the game Jenga. And the issue is just this. Some of us have made some of the minor issues the major issues. And we're worried that if we take this one piece out to examine and we realize that maybe we got it wrong a little bit, our whole thing's going to topple over. Again, the issue is that some people have not made their foundation of who they are completely in Christ. They've had Christ as sort of the, the, uh, the appetizer rather than the entree. I got food on my mind. Sorry, guys. In James chapter 1, this is what James said. This is the brother of Jesus. This is a good word. He says this, if any of you lack wisdom, so many of us are probably like, well, pastor, what do I do? What do how am I supposed to know if I have discernment? If any of you lack wisdom, here's the reality. If you're sitting in this room, you probably lack wisdom. I, I lack wisdom because none of us can ever feel like we've arrived. None of us can ever feel like we should never get to a place where we can feel like I couldn't accidentally fall into a trap. Because oftentimes when we get cocky, that's when we get humbled. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, James is the person that you don't really want to invite over to your house when you need someone to say nice things to you. But he's a good friend who, who speaks truth. Now, 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 don't misinterpret this idea that as followers of Jesus, as people wrestling with our faith, that we can't have doubts. God's not afraid of our doubts. God isn't worried about whether or not, uh, uh, like, you know, we're not going to offend God. I think some people worry about that. They're like, okay, let me swear and be mad about, like, life, and then when I get to, get to prayer... Dear Lord, you are so kind. Like, he doesn't need that. He doesn't need the, uh, if, you, if you are a mom, moms, you guys have this better than dads. I'm just going to be real. You can be in the middle of, like, a fight and, like, yelling at your children. And then, like, as soon as someone calls, hey, this is Jeannie. How are you? You don't need that in your prayer life. God wants the realness of who you are. And he's not afraid of your doubts. He can handle them. But what he's speaking to here is just this. There's many of us who have followed Jesus for a long time and we ask him to give us wisdom and he gives it and I think some of us are like, that's not what I ordered. I, I, I wanted a different answer. And here's the truth. The truth is set in stone. There's not going to be a day where you magically open the scripture and it's going to be like, aha, I now agree with you instead of what I really said. And that's the issue. For some of us, if we are careful, we can be thrown back and forth by different teachings and thoughts and ideologies and opinions. And, and, and here's the truth that kind of cuts across all people, all things, is that your opinions, feelings, desires, political leaning, nationality, ethnicity, gender, education, wealth, anything else does not determine truth. Only God does. 
It does not matter any of the other sort of categories that you may be sort of uh, put into. Those things do not get to dictate what is truth when all is said and done. Only God gets to do that. And praise God. If truth was dependent on me, that would be a scary place to be. Now let's talk about how, uh, a helpful way to understand how we can determine and, and sort of discern truth. And here, here, here's reality. I'm not going to get into today anything that's going to be about politics or things like that. You can figure out those sort of things again. But I will say, if you guys send me any sort of uh, 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 you know, website about something that says like uh, 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 makingliberalscry.com or uh, rightwingersareracist.org, uh, I'm probably not going to read what you've read as being any sort of factual truth. Be careful about what you share and what you allow to take in. That's all I'll say on that end. But when it comes to our faith, when it comes to our uh, 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 following Jesus, I think one helpful tool is something called the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which to me sounds like an incredible football play. If you've ever watched uh, Little Giants, if you remember the annexation of Puerto Rico, wonderful play. But I, if, if I was coaching football, I would probably try to throw in the Wesleyan quadrilateral. But anyways, what it is, is John Wesley was one of the co-founders of, of the Methodist Church, the Methodist Movement. And uh, uh, it, this is something that he did not write himself, but a, another sort of uh, uh, theologian afterwards looked at sort of his writing, his teaching, his beliefs, and said, there are these four principles that we see how we kind of interpret the world and how we interpret Scripture uh, from Wesley's example. And I think it's really great. He says there are these four principles, and they are not all created equal. He says, we should be informed in how we believe by scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Now, as you can kind of see the picture up there, the idea is this. Scripture is the baseline. Because again, while I, we can understand that people can interpret scripture in different ways, the reality is scripture is not something that can be bent and, 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 and sort of moved based off what we want to believe, our time, our culture. It, it's timeless. And then the idea is that the rest of them kind of come in a descending order, that we should lean into what is tradition say, recognizing that sometimes tradition has been wrong. I mean, we recognize that, right? I mean, it's a, it's a fair assessment to say the American church in particular, we could say we got some of our views on race wrong. You know, there was some really bad interpretations of that that led to things like slavery. It was wrong on that. But the reality is we have 2,000 years of the church, in a lot of it that's been right, in a lot of questions that we wrestle with are questions that followers of Jesus have been wrestling with for centuries, for millennia. And we must also decide that we should lean into what they have learned and learned from them. I don't understand the thought sometimes of people will be like, well, I just have to learn things on my own. That is so stupid. I don't need to touch a hot stove to know that it's going to be hot. I can watch my dumb older brother do it. And I can learn it just as well. We learn from tradition. We learn from reason. We, 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 we try, you know, God gave us this thing called a brain. It's this wonderful gift where we can learn and reason and think. I mean, that's one of the things why I know that God deeply loves us. He could have just made us into these like sort of like robot subservient sort of people. And if anything else, he gave us this gift of choosing him. I think that's why he desires our love so much, is that he knows how difficult, how many things are coming for our attention and desire. And when we truly get it and we truly lean into his love, man, that's got to be wonderful. And he doesn't need it, but he wants it. And finally, his experience. All of us have different experience that we bring to the table. And our experiences are valid. Our experiences are valid. But here's the thing, I, I, I see at least, this is my own perspective of the day, is oftentimes I think we kind of go in the reverse order today when we think about theology and God and things of that nature. We start by saying, what does my experience say or the experience of others? Then we say, well, let me reason this out and see where it is. And then I might say, well, what does, what, what, what does it seem like the church has historically said about this, good or bad? And then maybe I might make it to scripture. And the issue is just this. If we bring our experience to Scripture, again, our, 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 we're bringing confirmation bias. We're going to be looking to try to find some way to interpret Scripture in a way that we can feel good about how we're living. 
I mean, again, to use the example of slavery, there were people who used, used scriptures and like, see, this is, this is Ham's curse. This is why this is okay. It was never okay. It was always sin. It was always wrong. I think all of us would be in agreement of that. But it was easy for them to be able to sort of take their own experience of what they had inherited, a system that was unjust, how they could reason out this idea, and they could say that this is legit. When we try to do this undescending order, it's a bad place to be because we're not going to find the real truth. We're going to pick my truth. And the issue is just this. My truth is not God's truth. I wish it was sometimes. I wish he would have called me up at the beginning and asked my opinion. But he didn't. I wish he would have done that. But this is something that I think is a helpful tool for us to think through. Start with Scripture and work your way out from there. Allow those other things. And don't diminish other people's thoughts when they bring their experience to the table, when they bring their reason to their table, when they bring tradition to the table. But if it doesn't line up with the life and the teaching that we find in the Scriptures, then it's an opinion. It's not truth. Now, 1 John Uh, Chapter 4 says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are are from God, because many false prophets have come and gone into this world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Now again, this is a great place. If, if, if you want to understand truth, if you want to understand where it's coming from, if they don't acknowledge Jesus as Lord as the way, the truth, and the life, that, that right there is an easy, okay, this isn't true. And then if you go from there, you can kind of parse out and say, okay, what does the life and the teaching of Jesus say about this certain subject? If someone is, is pushing something that's counter to that, it's false. If they're pushing something that is in line with what Jesus taught and lived, you keep kind of following and trying to figure out. It's not that difficult because the reality is just this. All you have to do is ask God to give you wisdom and ask God to figure, help, help you kind of figure out what's going on. You know, again, sometimes too, we just have to sit in the chair. You know, sometimes faith is, is not just saying, I think that chair will hold me. Sometimes it's sitting it, and if it doesn't hold up, we know that wasn't real. And hopefully all we have is a sore butt. And we get to move on. Now, Ephesians chapter 4 says this. uh, I I love some of this imagery here. Uh, That, however, is not the way way of life you learned. This is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. He's, He's trying to call them out for not really continuing to grow again. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of us should put off falsehoods and speak truthfully to our neighbor as we are all members of one body. Now, when he says this, he's trying to convey to the church in Ephesus, that when you become a follower of Jesus, your desires, your thoughts, your opinions begin to be transformed. And we stop living in falsehoods. We stop saying falsehoods, and we begin to speak truthfully to our neighbors. How do we speak truthfully to our neighbors? It is a touchy subject. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, it also says this, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes. It's a great word. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every aspect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. If you've ever been around church, you've heard this term before, right? Speaking truth in love. Now, I'll be honest, there's sometimes I've, I've, I've found some people will say this and be like, I'm, I'm going to speak truth in love, which is sort of a license to be like, I'm going to say something mean and unkind. Or let me share my opinion with you. I'm just speaking truth in love, sister. Or sometimes even people gossip, it's like, listen, I was just trying to help out my brother by speaking truth and love. 
couple, couple things to think about. You see, when we speak truth without love, if we're honest, truth is, it doesn't matter about our feelings, it doesn't matter about all those things, but the reality is, is this, when we speak truth without love, oftentimes it can be condescending, it can be critical, it can be uh, a little bit callous and condemning, and it's the absence of, of freedom and mutuality that is necessary for love to thrive. Because the truth is, sometimes some of us, if we're really honest, we like to speak truth to people who aren't living truth because it makes us feel good. Some of us like to be right in an unhealthy way. In fact, some of us care more about being right than being loving. And I don't think those things are mutually exclusive, but I do fear some people feel as if their calling is to be the person who calls other people out all the time. And I think the issue is just this, that's not speaking truth in love. If you heard the scripture well, the idea of speaking truth in love is to create unity in the body. It's to create a sense of people uh, turning their hearts and minds back to Jesus, not just speaking your truth and throwing it like a grenade and walking away and feeling like, yes. You see, some people want to speak truth, maybe a little bit absence of love, with the idea of kind of owning people and destroying people. That's, That's what I don't get, if I'm really honest, especially people who claim to be followers of Jesus. When they use terms uh, at people when they just automatically say, well, if you believe this, you're a fascist. Or I can't believe you sheeple over here. I don't know about you. I don't know that I feel like that's the way that I see Jesus Christ of Nazareth talking to people, even when they're living in falsehoods. So here's a couple questions to consider as we're going to begin to kind of land the plane. A couple questions to consider about when and how you should speak truth and love. The first one is just this. Do you have the right motives? Do you have the right motives? Again, sometimes I think some people want to speak truth and love to feel good or to kind of own people. And if your goal is that, that's not helpful, that's not good. Second question is, do you have the right relationship? You know, there's a couple things to, to parse out in Scripture, is oftentimes we see a distinguishingness of calling out those who are followers of Jesus versus those who are not. Can I tell you guys something real quick? Scripture does not call us out to call out non-Christians for what they believe. We're to call them to the gospel, to the good news of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. We're not called to hold people who don't follow Jesus Christ accountable to things they haven't signed up for. I know that might sound weird to some people, but, 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 but the truth is just this. If, if they haven't signed up for it, then we don't have to call them out onto it. We want to call them to it, but we don't call them out on it. So yes, we shouldn't be just outraged when people who don't follow Jesus Christ live counter to what he calls us to. This should not be shocking. But the question is, do we have the right relationship? You know, there's times where I see people say something or post something. I'm like, oh, I want to say something to them. But you know what I've realized? I don't have the relationship to do that. Because at the end of the day, the goal with speaking truth in love should be to get someone to have a changed and repentant heart. And if you don't have the right motivations and you don't have the right relationship, the reality is you're probably not making a heart change for them that day. I have never had my opinion or my posture changed by someone else's opinion that they have that I didn't know. I've never met a stranger who came up to me and said, all men shouldn't have beards, shave it now or you're going to hell. And I haven't ran home and shaved my beard. Most of us have never had our opinion changed because someone belittled us or made us feel like crap right? Especially a stranger. We've never been like, "Ah, I'm changing now, at least not for the good. If we want to see people truly have uh, a, a, a opening of their eyes to truth, we need to have the right motives and the right relationship. And we also have to check the reality of, am I sharing an opinion or am I sharing fact? 
Am I trying to share about something that is a major salvation pending issue? Or is this something secondary? Is this something that has not a lot to do with following Jesus, but it's something that I'm passionate about? Because the issue is this. Some of us make salvation pending gospel issues out of things that Jesus didn't die on the cross for. Jesus died on, a, died on a hill for all of us, but there's some of us who want to die on hills for things that Jesus never would have. And we have to parse out, when am, I, when am I wanting to call people out for an opinion that I have, or when am I calling them out for the reality that I actually think what they're doing is counter to the, fo- to the, the following and the teaching of Jesus Christ, and I actually care about them. See, the problem in our culture today, I think, uh, is that, that people have with Christians isn't that we're silent about truth, but it's that our actions do not reflect the truth that has transformed us. Meaning, I think one of the issues is so many people get mad that we're viewed uh, as, as uh, some people would say, well, the problem today is that the church is too silent on issues. And there's some truth in that. But I think the bigger issue isn't our silence with our words, but is our actual actions and lifestyles. For some people, they hear us saying, stop doing this, stop doing that, and they see that our life doesn't really live up to that. Again, we're seen sometimes as hypocrites, which some of it isn't fair, but some of it, if the shoe fits, wear it. And so the issue is just this. We as followers of Jesus have to begin to not only just speak truth, but some of us need to just actually start living the truth. I want to end today by just uh, reading from you the Gospel of Matthew. And this is Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, and he gives us a great sort of format because I think one of the other pieces that we have to do as followers of Jesus when it comes to speaking truth is to speak truth back to the enemy. Because every single one of us, every day, are tempted, are put in situations where the enemy is trying to trap us, trying to get us to sin and stumble. And Jesus gives us a great template of what do we do when this happens. And then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After 40 days of fasting and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. You see, I love this example that we have of Jesus, that when we have falsities put towards us, propositions of temptation, we don't just walk away from them, we yell truth at them. When Satan tries to tell us, believe that, tell him what is true. Do you realize every time Jesus would quote Scripture back to him, and he would say to him the truth when Satan tried to bring him some sort of falsity. Many of us need to begin to being diligent studiers of God's word so that way, not if, but when we are tempted, when we are uh, uh, set up for a trap of ideas or actions or attitudes, we can speak truth from God's word to that thing and say, no, 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 no. I want to end by saying this as we're going to close in prayer. Truth is heavy. Truth is heavy. It's difficult. It's, it can feel burdensome. But you know what? Truth is even heavier if you don't know Jesus. But it's freedom if you do know him. Jesus once said this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There are some people I know who try to live truth without Jesus, and it's heavy and it's impossible. 
If you're a person who's prone to being a rule follower and prone to always being right, I implore you, make sure that you know Jesus because trying to carry the truth without Jesus is heavy. And if you're a person who views truth as being something that is constricting, I hope you would take a chance and recognize that you don't find true freedom until you take on the heaviness of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that truth just begins by recognizing this. You have been broken. You have wandered in darkness. You have felt empty. But God so loved you that he sent his son Jesus into this world to restore you, to redeem you, and to invite you to sit at your father's table where you belong. And it has nothing to do with anything you could deserve, anything you can earn, but it has everything to do with the fact that God loves you, and God wants to be with you. Would you guys pray with me this morning? In fact, I'm going to ask you guys to stand real quick as we are going to close out in prayer, and I'm going to pray a prayer of commissioning as we leave this place. Father God, we thank you for your son Jesus, and we thank you for his bride, the church. God, I thank you for this church. God, I pray this morning that for those listening, God, whether they're here in person or online, that God, maybe this morning we've had to confront the realities of living in lies. And Father God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, we would recognize that these lies don't have to define us, but we can step into your truth and find freedom in you. That God, we'd recognize that there's nothing special we have to do. There's not something that we have to jump through all these hoops. But Lord, we just have to say to you, Father, forgive me. Father, make me new. And Father, help me follow your son, Jesus. And if someone would pray a prayer like that today, Father God, there we know there'd be a party going on in heaven in this moment. But God, as we leave this place, Father, we do recognize that we live in a world full of lies. We have people who even try to look like they're telling the truth, but are full of lies. And so, Father God, I pray that you, through your Holy Spirit, God, would give us wisdom and discernment, that you would help us to know when we should speak and when we should be silent, when we need to, uh, uh, get, uh, when, when we need to uh, reassess what we have thought and when we need to decide that maybe something inside of us is more us than you. But, Father God, refine us into your image, make us into your children, And God, make us messengers of hope into this world. And God, may that message of hope not just be with our words, but would be with our life and our example. Father, we love you, and we ask you to help give us moments to love our neighbors as ourselves this week, and remind us that you're always with us, and that you're always for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Friends, have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday for Recovery Sunday.